Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Tardy, and today I'm actually right near Austin, Texas at a ranch with Mike Dillard and Robert Hirsch, right? Good. Yes. Okay. They own the Elevation Group. It's an amazing company. When they first launched back in 2010, they made $3.2 million in eight days, which is a little ridiculous. And so I'm really excited to have them on the show, even though I'm here. Thank you for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Glad you uh, could make it down. So tell me a little bit about what the Elevation Group is, because I went on your website and ended up saying things are changing, and I had no real clue, I guess, on what what it really is. So go ahead and tell me a little bit more. Yes, yeah, something we have to work on. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks for the great frame, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally awesome. <laughs> it's amazing. Go. Um, you know, the Elevation Group was, uh, was started back in uh, the end of 2010. And it was really inspired by the, the crash of the market crash of 2008. And you know, I saw personally a lot of my, my family members and their friends in the baby boomer generation, you know, take a huge hit as far as the retirement went. A lot of them were under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, wondering if they could even retire moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had at that point started several successful uh, businesses, uh, made, you know, done, done quite well for myself. I had just turned 30 in 08 and I had no idea what to do with the money. Uh, and I saw what was happening to my parents and their friends and I said, well, this is what I don't want to do, which was to really follow in their path and what Robert and I like to call a, was uh, Wall Street's promise, which is, you know, give Wall Street your money every year for the next 40 years and you'll have enough left over to retire, um, which has proven to be not the case. Mm -hmm. And the frustrating part was we couldn't find an alternative answer. And so we have a group of very wealthy people who tend to make money whether the market goes up or down. And then we have the rest of the middle class who is really uh, reactionary and, and typically victims of any kind of market event. Uh, but there's no bridge between the two. And so if we couldn't find the answer of, hey, how do we invest like the rich invest so we can get results like they get, uh, then we decided that we'd go really figure that out ourselves. and. Then, share the lessons learned uh, with the rest of the world. And so our real mission statement is, uh, you know, the Elevation Group is really here to empower the, the middle class with the investing strategies of the wealthy, uh, with the premise being if you want to become wealthy and get a specific result, you have to do what the wealthy are doing. So That's awesome. It's actually exactly what like Eventual Millionaire is all about, which works out really well, except you went on the investing side. So anyone that's listening, if they're excited about investing, I get asked about that quite a bit. Go talk to them, not me. I well, that's, that was investing. the whole thing. Nobody in, in this industry ever talked about it. They talk about how to make money, but not mm. what to do with it. Now, that's the funny thing, though. It seems like a hard niche to get into because there's so much already out there having to do with investing and some of it's crap and all that fun stuff. How do you dive into a niche like that and do so well in such a short period of time? Well, the biggest issue is I remember when, uh, and both of us were fans of Robert Kiyosaki, and mm -hmm. I remember when I... I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and it was the mid '90s, and I was I was living in San Francisco, and I was running venture back startups, mm -hmm. and you know it was great, and I was an entrepreneur, but I still had a job, so to speak, meaning I had to show up, or my investors and my board would fire me, and so I I I realized that the the poor lust after do dads, and the the middle class invest in liability, the liabilities that they think are assets, and the wealthy invest in assets. Although he although he would talk about that, but he wouldn't get into the specifics mm -hmm. of what, it, what is an asset? So that was really where I was left. I was very excited by the book, but had nowhere to go. And that came down to really Mike and I. So Mike and I, um, you know, I had a private equity fund up in Colorado, uh, and I was on the board of the Elevation Group. And what we would spend our time talking about was how do we invest our money? And so uh, actually, this was before the Elevation Group. This was your previous company when, when I was doing the coaching. And we'd talk about, you know, after we get done working during the day, we'd then go to the night. And during night, what we would talk about is, well, what are you doing? And it, and it felt like throwing spaghetti against the wall, but there was really very little rhyme or reason. Mm. And the biggest issue is if you go to, you know, my parents are, are very middle class, as are Mike's, mm. and uh, they have a financial advisor, and mm -hmm. they show you this, this pyramid of six things. Have you ever seen that pyramid? I think I have, yes. Right, and, and so they show you this pyramid of six things, and you can start buying these, and you can eventually buy these. But coincidentally, they sell all of those six items to you. and. It was a great pitch, um, but the problem is, is it didn't work for my parents, and now <laughs> why am I going to go do it? Yeah. So what we thought, and, and at this point, you know, we've gone through the, 
you know, the cars and the houses and the, you know, and the toys, mm. but I really didn't have anything to show for it. And so what we wanted to do is take our active income and translate it as effectively as we could into passive income. And we thought, well, if we're having this problem, two successful entrepreneurs, then a lot of other people are having those problems. Yeah. And that was really the, that was really the kernel that became the Elevation Group. So you had a need and you're like, oh, I actually want to figure this out for myself. I should go do this and help other people. Might as well. That so tends to be our, our formula is find a problem that we have. If there are other people who have it as well, which is usually the case, then there's a huge business opportunity waiting to happen right there. Okay, so and that's what I want to talk about. So you guys are both ridiculously experienced in business, right? And so it's interesting to sort of hear your story of how I did really well in business, and then of course I didn't know how to do the investing part. A lot of people that are listening are sort of still getting to the business side of things, so I really want to talk about that. And you guys have two separate stories. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows, like I usually don't interview two people, so we're going to go with this. Um, so Mike, why don't you start? Because and it's funny because I, I was reading through your bio and seeing uh, Magnetic Sponsoring was mm -hmm. your previous company, and mm -hmm. I bought Magnetic Sponsoring. I didn't know this was the you guy did? that did it. Yeah. Oh wow. I know. Good to know, right? <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate yeah, it. Cool. Um, so why don't you go through and sort of tell us a quick history? I know because we have a ton of stuff to dive into, but a quick history of sort of how you became an entrepreneur and sort of some of the companies that you started. Sure. I started, uh, you know, specifically in the network marketing industry. Um, I was in college from 1996 to 2000, uh, which is kind of in Web 1.0 days, where oh, yeah. if a website had a video on it, it was a really big deal. Oh, yeah. you know, and I come from Web 0.0. <laughs> yeah. And it was, that, it was that gap, you know? And so, so I got, there, the opportunities that are out there today to become an entrepreneur on the, online were not there specifically at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, that was when Corey Rudel came out with his first ebook on how to get out of a traffic ticket, and that was like revolutionary. God you know, you can it. sell in a digital book online, and and uh, and so the network marketing industry ha had been much bigger. It's been around for decades. Uh, you know, with Herbalife, Mary Kay, and Amway, and 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 I, you know, they they, they find those opportunities find their way specifically through college campuses pretty easily because you've got a bunch of broke students who are looking for business opportunities, and I happen to be one of them, and. Uh, so I got involved in that industry and, and failed miserably for four or five years. And, <laughs> I love uh, hearing that. Okay, I have to stop you for a second. What did you start and what failed? Because we want to know details on why you failed or uh, how you failed. Yeah, well, it took me many years to find out, but I used to look for success in the opportunity itself or the compensation plan or the new wonder product of the month or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, I'd always wonder why isn't this working? For me, when other people are having success, and, and I finally realized that it came down to um, value, and I really didn't have any value at the age of 20 to offer anybody. I was a broke college student with no particular skill set, trying to pretend to be an entrepreneur, and um, and so what I finally figured out is you really have to create value to give to others, and the way that I've learned how to do that was to acquire skill sets. So I started studying uh, direct response marketing and copywriting from Dan Kennedy and Gary Halbert and John Carlton and all of those people. And um, I, all of a sudden, I kind of figured out I had a knack for, for marketing and, and for writing um, and learned how to use direct response marketing and Google AdWords, which was when it first came out, uh, to build my network marketing business. And so uh, I went from doing meetings in hotel rooms and living rooms to doing this all online, and that really transformed my career and uh, so magnetic sponsoring was actually written as a training manual for my downline <laughs> on how to use these direct response attraction marketing techniques instead of the whole you know make a, a, a list of your friends and family kind of a deal um, which really went on to to revolutionize that industry so that was the the inception of that business which went from an ebook and turned into an eight-figure business with two offices and you know a dozen employees so that's a little insane to go from five years of not being able to figure things out and then sort of having almost a switch going, okay, I need a skill set that's worth something. Well, all I had previously was the exact same opportunity and product that 100,000 other distributors had. Yeah. So there was nothing unique for me to actually offer my customers or my business, my business partners. And once I kind of figured that out, that the opportunity is 
not with the business itself, it's with you as an individual, mm -hmm. um, then that's really when things change. So. Now, what's the difference for you, though? Because a lot of people come and go, network marketing is sort of easy to get into. And I've, I just had MJ DeMarco on the show mm -hmm. who's like, you kind of want to be the owner of the MLM, not necessarily well, the, the person place. in it. Yeah. And so we, we talk a lot about that stuff. Mm -hmm. What was the difference between doing the, ML, the network marketing stuff and also like starting your own business? Because it seems like it's different. Well, I think it has to do with personality styles. Mm -hmm. I'm fairly introverted and... Um, and and people tended to annoy me fairly. I mean, specifically in the network marketing. I love hearing that. <laughs> well, in the network marketing industry, you're constantly dealing with new people mm. that you then have to train and you have to take them through the process of transformation from an employee to an entrepreneur and all the personal development that happens around that. And I just didn't have the patience level needed for that. Mm. And I, I just realized I don't really enjoy talking to people in person or on the phone, but I love reading and writing and and being creative and putting things creative online. And so it was just a personality fit. Mm. Uh, where for other people who are super extroverted, love that industry and do very, very well in it. So That's awesome. Okay, so you really are, what you're saying is figuring out your skills and also what you're good at yeah. and then using that. Now it's funny because I just had a guy on the show who talked about um, sort of doing the hard stuff though that maybe you're not really good at. What are your feelings are on, actually that interview hasn't gone out yet. So, um, But one of the things that he was saying is that someone who's really, really good at something, sometimes they tend to coast um, and don't sort of look at some of the harder stuff. But really, a lot of the stuff can be on that little hard stuff that you don't really want to work on. Do well, that's where Robert came into play. Yeah. Is yeah. I got really, really good at Great marketing segue. and copywriting, but I, was, I learned that I was bad at running a business then. Growing a team, uh, you know, being a CEO, dealing with firing and hiring and all of those things. And um, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> He is yeah. the CEO, by the way. <laughs> well, that's, and so, so you know, what for me, it's an ego thing. It's like you can either recognize what you're good at and really master that, mm -hmm. or you can say, oh, I want to, I'm the boss, I want to be the boss, and even if I suck at being the boss, and that to me is a really stupid decision, mm -hmm. and I realized that I was not a good boss, and, and, you know, that's where Robert came in, and he was actually, um, you know, my coach to help me build and run magnetic sponsoring, and um, and he, you know, eventually realized that our skill sets are are super uh, symbiotic, and uh, instead of him like teaching hippo, you everything, like just do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, so that's probably a great segue into into Robert's, you know. Well, yeah. you know, and I'd love to come back to that leaning into the hard stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, because I I think that's a word. To me, it's the exact opposite of what I'd recommend. Okay. And that's what I hear, and that's good. I mean, the Keep way going. the way I would the way I would view this is is you figure out one thing that you're really good at, mm -hmm. and uh, it's funny. Mike and I were doing a little bit of filming uh, earlier in the week on an entrepreneurial product, and uh, you know our our formula is really simple, and we both arrived at it very independently. Mm -hmm. Which and, and the first part is you identify a problem, mm -hmm. and if you want to start a business, go identify a problem, and then find an elegant solution. And the key to that is elegance. So, um, and elegance is often in simplicity. So Warren Buffett says that you, that you don't get points in business for a degree of difficulty. And that is so true. And when I think of the hard stuff, it's, it, 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 it evokes this really strong reaction in me. Yeah. And, and if you can find, and what I mean by elegant is really high yield and very low drag, meaning high results, low effort, mm -hmm. and low work for you. Because doing things like interviews are, are really easy for you, right, Jamie? Mm. But it doesn't make it less valuable to your readership. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe maybe you don't like to write, or maybe you don't like to manage, or maybe you don't like to operate. I, I wouldn't recommend doing any of that. I would say go get somebody, partner with somebody, uh, to do the pieces that you can't do, and go do as many interviews as you possibly can. Mm. Now, the third part of that formula is to acquire a rainmaking skill. And Everybody wants to know the rainmaking skill. Well, you have to know. <laughs> if you don't know a rainmaking skill, you don't have a business. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Zig Ziglar, who passed away recently, mm -hmm. said nothing happens until something gets sold. And, I mean, you don't have accounts receivable unless you have a sale, right? It, yeah. It's a pretty simple... You don't really have a business it, it's, you a have a sale. Simple, it's a pretty simple <laughs> equation. So what, what Mike was describing before in his four or five years, and I've, had, mm -hmm. I've been in business 23 years and been a part of over 55 businesses, um, and, and some of them were, were absolute rocket ships. We've had some great exits, we've, we've had an IPO, and we've had some, uh, conversely, we've had some smoldering holes in the ground as well. And um, what's the difference is acquiring that rainmaking skill. Okay. And whether you're one of the best copywriters on the planet, like Mike is, and 
had a capital M marketing, meaning strategic marketing, not SEO. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, I, I learned how to sell. So my background was was raising capital in, in Silicon Valley, which essentially is selling an idea for millions of dollars. So if you can't taste it, touch it, smell it, feel it, I sell it. <laughs> and so that that's a different level of salesmanship. Oh yeah. But you have to acquire some skill to make it rain. And I had a mentor of mine um, along the way that, uh, yeah, well, a guy named Bill Phillips, uh, Body for Life, EAS. Oh, yeah, I love that and guy. so Bill, Bill told me, and I remember I was, uh, I was at his place, uh, and he had this beautiful, I don't know how many square foot home, but it felt at the time like over 20,000 square feet. I mean, it felt palatial. I, I mean, there was a pool on the side, there was a pool on the other side, and there was a pool in back. Just in case your first two pools aren't working, you can go to the third one. And uh, I remember looking around, I was in awe. He, he, he just watched me. And, 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 and he said, what do you think? And I'm like, it's not bad. You know? and, and, uh, and you know, I was pretty intimidated. So, so, you, know, and, and so, you played it cool, and, and he, I, I tried to, and uh, he saw right through it. And he said, you know, the amount of money that you make is directly proportionate to the amount of people that you help. Mm -hmm. And that really resonated. So, you know, if you take those three things, if you identify a problem, you validate that other people have that problem, mm -hmm. like where do I invest my money? And, and for example, we're entrepreneurs. We, we had made, uh, well, a, a lot in sales, somewhere in the eight or nine figures, however you count it, in, in, in the businesses. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't know where to invest, why would we use a financial advisor that's, strip, that's sitting in a strip mall from nine to five and he's going to tell us where to invest it? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. And so, Find somebody that's living the life that you want to. And, and that is really what came down to Elevation Group and what was so passionate. So we've, we've ended up with, you know, reclusive, amazing, successful people in Aspen down to, to Necker Island for a week with Richard Branson and, and everywhere in between. But there was always one common denominator, which was really interesting. Each person owned their own business. Every person had their own business. And if you have a job, no matter how successful you are, you're always going to be disadvantaged by the tax system. You're always going to be disadvantaged by, by a, a host of things. But you're essentially, you're running into a buzzsaw because you make your money and your taxes are taken out before you get your money and then you get to spend the difference. And as a business owner, it's the exact opposite. You're in your revenue, you spend a reasonable business expense and you're taxed on your profit. And so in, in, in one way, you're, you're, you're really incentivized to succeed and create jobs. And in the other way, it becomes very punitive. Mm. And so reaching that inflection point and making the jump is, you know, is a really critical point for, for anybody. But of everybody that we've encountered for the last three years of the Elevation Group, every wildly successful millionaire or billionaire that we found on their own business. Mm, I agree. And I think everybody listening totally agrees with that. And that's why we're trying to do this. But what we hear from you, find a need. A lot of people are like, okay, I found needs. We can find needs everywhere. Where, sure. Especially entrepreneurial mindset people are like, squirrel, you know, like sure. find needs everywhere we go. But a lot of the problems that we have are with rainmaking. So that's sort of the thing that I'd love to ask you about, especially sure. in regards to the Elevation Group. Because if you can in eight days make that amount of money, that seems almost impossible to the people that are listening. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll throw in Please. how that was done. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so you're looking at the, that point, you're looking at the end result of you know, the, the previous equity that had been put into you know, magnetic sponsoring and growing that business. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that, that was the result of the previous seven years of work. Mm. Um, but at the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what that represents was cashing in on personal brand equity. And so, you know, the, the Elevation Group business offer was, was very interesting um, in the fact that what we were selling uh, was the fact that we are not financial experts in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what we're doing when it comes to investing, um, and, uh, and and just didn't have a clue. So we're going to, you know, sell a membership where we're going to go figure this puzzle out and solve this problem for ourselves, and let you join us and kind of look over our shoulder and learn from the people we learn from. And we were just going to document everything that we did with our money. Uh, and kind of almost like a virtual online diary. And so that was the pitch, that was the, that was the offer. And the reason that it worked the way that it did was the honesty and the authenticity of that, mm -hmm. where we weren't pretending to be people that we weren't. Um, we were very uh, straightforward with 
you know, what this project was going to consist of and that, that we weren't the experts here. And uh, so in the, first, in the first month, we had 10,000 members join. Um, had huge affiliate support from all over the industry, which was another reason that that was possible. Mm -hmm. um, and because at the end of the day, what people were buying into was not a, a sophisticated stock trading financial program because nobody's into that. If you're an average everyday person, you don't get involved in that. That's why you have a financial advisor, so you don't have to do that stuff. And, um, and so it was more of the promise of an adventure and to make finance interesting and to, to turn it into a journey. Um, and I think everybody kind of has a voyeuristic side at, you know, at one level or another where if you get to, I mean, that's why we watch you know, reality television shows and, and, uh, and all of those things. So, so that was the interesting part about it. And at the end of the day, it just became this mission to where like, hey, we're going to pick up the torch and, and start this movement to really empower the rest of the world against, you know, the, the crappy options that they've had before. Um, and the market really just resonated with that. So something that they can all get behind. That's really yeah. interesting. I get a lot of people, though, that go, well, I don't have an expert or skill. And like me showing people how I'm no. learning it doesn't seem like that's a good thing. It seems really kind of icky. How did you get over that? Or did you have to? I didn't think it was icky at all. I thought I, I don't think I don't think it is. But I. But you, people use that excuse as an excuse. excuse. Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, and so it was kind of fun to disprove that. And but I think I think if uh, if you're just super open and transparent about it, mm. and you can say, hey, here's what we've got planned, and here's what you know we've done when we launched. You know, we had three lessons in the members area. Um, you know, now we're well over twenty, and and so they were going to get something from day one. They could log in, see if there was value to it or not. Um, but we could do that with any topic. Anybody could do that with yeah. any topic. But you just have to, if you pretend, people are going to see through that. And then sure. you become, you know, uh, uh, pick your negative order that you would like to, yeah. to choose. You know, so. Or those guys. Hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what I think is really cool about you guys. You're real. And that's why I did these interviews. Because I want to go, no, you're, yeah. you're a real person. You're sure. not, you know, you're not this fake persona or anything like that. But what I think is really interesting that you said before is that it took seven years of trying to, so we hear like the huge success story, eight days, it was awesome, it was amazing. <laughs> we, and it's so easy to yeah. hear that, oh, you guys, well, you guys have this separate special thing that we don't have, therefore we couldn't do that. Yeah. But you mentioned seven years of hard work of finding people and making relationships and doing of all course. that sort of stuff before. I, so take me through like some of that. Like what should people, especially when they're sitting there right now going, I could do that. I could be, hey, really transparent. I'm going to try and figure this this problem. I'll come along with me. Where the heck do I start? <laughs> well, there's a lot of places where you can you can start, but ultimately, the the one thing, at least for me, that gets you over the edge entrepreneurially, is you develop a skill that allows you to make it rain. Mm, yeah, so there, there's there's an entrepreneurial there's an entrepreneurial piece there, and it, it, it might sound like a broken record, but it, it's it's like that because it's true. So. If you have a business, right, and you have great sales and you have bad accounting, what do you do, right? Well, you, you fire your accountant and you hire another one. Mm -hmm. And now if you have a business and you have great accounting and bad sales, what do you do? Well, you sell your house, right? That's, that's kind of the reality of it. If you, can't, if you can't sell and make it rain, you're going back to your old job. You're mm -hmm. going to go back to waiting tables. You're going to do whatever it was. Yeah. So it, it's really acquiring that skill set. And for some people, it, it you know, for some people it takes a year. For me, it took much longer. Okay. Oh, but you have to. Oh, <laughs> a lot of people learn faster than we do. But and the resources that are available today are so much better mm. than what was available. Mm. You know, for for me, it was it was well pre-internet uh, in in terms of, of of what resources were out there. I was pretty much limited to the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Who doesn't? Mm. And uh, and so you're going to learn the lessons, and it's going to be as fast or as slow as it takes. But mm. it's a it's a, it's a predetermined endpoint. So there are ways that you can get there where you have this rainmaking skill. And there are ways that, you know, that you, sometimes you go over the river and through the woods to get there. And there's <laughs> direct paths. But the sooner that you apply yourself to really learn that, you know, the more successful you can be. And I, I think what's interesting with, with Elevation Group in particular is, is we, you know, we are not the experts. You get a chance to watch over our shoulder mm. as we learn, and, and that includes the winds and the, the the smoldering holes in the ground as well. Yeah, and we've had both. Yeah. We've had both. I mean, as a company, it's been really successful. But follow us on an adventure. Every adventure wasn't pre-planned with the set, 
you know, Disneyland moment at the end. I mean, we, we had... <laughs> oh, that's not how I wanted it to end. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we yeah. had, you know, we, it was a learning experience. And, yeah. and we encountered great people and we encountered a couple bad people too. Yeah. And what we learned was, you know, it, it was interesting because, um, and, and Mike and I at the beginning were both really enchanted by these promises of big returns. Mm -hmm. you know? 30%, 40%. And, and what we found is, is those returns don't seem to be realistic on a passive basis, on a mm -hmm. consistent basis. Um, from a business perspective or an entrepreneurial perspective, those are, those are really possible mm -hmm. when you're working on it. But you know, if, if you're changing that to passive, what you really want is wealth, wealth preservation as well as capital appreciation as well as passive income. Mm -hmm. And so instead of getting seduced by the biggest number you can find, Find things that make sense to you. And if it doesn't make sense, and if you can explain it, and uh, how old is your oldest child now? Six. Six. So if your six-year-old can understand it, you know, then, then it good. makes sense. And if you can't understand it, it mm -hmm. really comes down to a, you know, a couple things. Either there's a communication issue, um, or you know, it's above your head, or whatever the case may be. But generally, if you can't understand it, don't do it. You know, and, and for example, Mike has done really well doing uh, apartment complexes. And I, I've ended up in oil and gas and oil wells because really? it, it makes more sense. Hmm. And we have a partner in it, and, we, and all of this is documented within the Elevation Group. But what appeals to one person doesn't necessarily appeal to the other. Mm. But if you can't understand it, don't do it. Okay, so that's what I sort of want to talk to you about in terms of business, though. Because like you said, you need to have this skill. You need to figure out how to do this. And that's sure. exactly what you guys did with the Elevation Group, like tried to figure it out as you went. But there is, we are inundated with information. We don't know what's right. We don't know what's wrong. We don't know what's right for us because it might sure. not work for us. And that's kind of a pain in the butt to go through and figure out, especially yeah. for someone who doesn't have a lot of resources. They're like, I really want to quit my job or I'm starting this business and it's not going as well as I hoped. I don't know how much longer this is going to last. So what can you give us to try and help that? Because you said, you know, we don't want to go over the river and through the woods. How can we get a little bit straighter? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll stab at this real quick. Sure. Uh, I, I would call it information overload, mm -hmm. right? That's typically how it's referred to, and uh, at least in the, the, the education publishing world. Um, there were definitely many years, especially when I was first starting, uh, where that was the case. And you know, you'd have five courses that you just bought, and, and they're similar in some ways, and, and they're all slightly different in other ways. Yeah. And, um, and you're like, ah, what do I do? And the bad news is I never... My, my solution, the way I got through it, is I just kept working through it and then just kept thinking about what is the end goal that I want? What do I want my business to look like? What's the lifestyle that I want? And what am I good at? And then coming up with a model that really fit that. And you know, I think Robert and I's you know, first goal to, to give any new entrepreneur is just to make your first sale. Mm -hmm. That's it, just your first transaction. I've got you know, some friends who are going through our entrepreneur course sure. uh, right now. and, and uh, you know, uh, one of them is doing a jewelry line. Another one is writing an ebook on parenthood. Uh, another one is doing an ebook on um, nutrition and health and weight loss. And it's it's funny to walk them through this process because they'll come back and they'll be like, "Should I get this software and that? Should I buy this course or go to this coaching thing?" And I'm just like, "No, <laughs> buy the really cheap version of the software. Don't buy any other courses. Just take that next step and then come back and tell me when you're done." And uh, and so the whole goal is just to get them to make that first sale. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you know, go do whatever you, you are interested in and, uh, and want to pursue. But, uh, for me, I went through all of the courses and I just had to wade through it until I got that solid idea that I wanted to pursue. And then I shut everything else out. I unsubscribed from all the email lists and I just focused until it was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just one, one brick a day you know, to build your house kind of mm. thing, so. It's so hard because it feels slow when you're in it, like hearing the success story, but when you're actually in it and things fail and you're still going, like, how come it's taking so long yeah, and that sure. sort of thing? And, and I know you're the scale guy, so even after we get the first sale, it cannot feel fast. Like, what, what suggestions would you give in terms of, say you got your first sale, you feel like you have some, you know, yay, I'm all excited I got my first sale. Repeat that process yeah. over and over again as fast as possible. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Oh, good. Do it so again. tell me how. <laughs> Find out if they have a sibling. And uh, no, I, you know, and, and there, you know, what's interesting, and it depends on what kind of business you're in, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so let's say from the zero to somewhere between one and five million in sales. Now, the skills that get you from there, mm -hmm. 
not only are different than the ones that get you from five to 50, but they're juxtaposed, hmm. which is really difficult for a lot of entrepreneurs. So this is really kind of the entrepreneurial hump that, uh, that a lot of people have and have a hard time getting over. So what gets you from zero to one or zero to five is really stick to you know, mm -hmm. hit the same nail on the head, persistence, you know, education, learning, and going out and going to every trade show you can and, and staying up till 12 o'clock, meeting as many people as you can at the bar, and doing all those types of things. It becomes your trick. It does. It becomes your move. Yeah, you get a move. Like my move Ooh. is I could, I could start as many businesses as I want in the zero to five range every single time and do it because it's become my move. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as soon as I hit that $5 million range, I have to start hiring and building a team, then I fall on my face, which is where he comes in. <laughs> right. so. Your move is different and, than his move. We have different moves. <laughs> and uh, we have different moves. And so, um, and, and, and so the big issue is what takes you from five to 50? Mm -hmm. If you do that, stick to it, and if keep hitting the same nail the same head, those will actually prevent you from succeeding. Hmm. And it's, it's like the classic jump in corporate America when you go from a first line manager to a second line manager. It, you know, it, it's a difficult one. And so then it becomes uh, the ability to, to really empower people, hmm. which is delegating without absconding, you know, delegating and, and, and giving them the tools they need to succeed and getting out of the way. So, you know, your, your, your skill in the zero to five is getting in the way. And your skill in, in the five to 50 is really getting out of the way. Well, it's doing the thing versus getting the thing done. Exactly. And so that is, that is you know, really the, the big entrepreneurial hump that a lot of people go through. And, and for example, when, when, you know, when Mike talks about you know, what happened at the beginning of, of Elevation Group, and, and that's exciting because it's a great sound bite, right? Yes, totally. Especially in the business you're in. But there's a lot of hard work that goes into that. Mm. And so for me, the, the biggest thing that, you know, for an entrepreneur listening, you know, and it's interesting, we're going through, we're going through a lot of coaching of young entrepreneurs through this process. And, and uh, you know, and I've, I've mentored a lot of people along the way, and I continue to work with people, both, both mentors and mentees. And uh, you know, it's great on the entrepreneurial life cycle. But I, I think I've had so many great mentors through the, through, the, um, through the life cycle. It's been incredible. And so the, the biggest learning opportunity for me is being able to find and groom a mentor. Ooh, let's talk about that. And so there's a skill set to being a good mentee. Got it. Mm. Um, and that's what a lot of people don't realize. So a lot of people are thinking, well, maybe the CEO wants to give something back, which giving back is a phrase I hate. Well, let's hope he does. Yeah, yeah. let's hope he does, right? <laughs> because giving back implies that you've taken something, mm -hmm. which I don't think about it that way. I just think about it as giving more. Mm. And so being a good mentee, you understand that they have a limited amount of time. After a period of time, you know, you need to make room for other people in his life. You need to make room in your life. Mm. So if you think of a mentorship life cycle, it usually lasts between nine and 24 months. Mm -hmm. So you wanna really make it low drag on the mentor and really rewarding as a mentee. And, and, so if, and if you can give them some element of where you are gonna mentor the next generation, mm -hmm. you know, and, offer, and offer that piece of legacy, which is often what the mentor is looking for, they're moving from growth to legacy in the entrepreneurial life cycle, mm -hmm. that's a really key piece. So the, the, the way that I've groomed mentors um, is one, making it real low drag on them. One hour, one hour a month, your favorite lunch spot on me, whenever you say the word and I, I'll be there. Mm -hmm. um, two is I know that's a limited life cycle. I know this isn't gonna last longer than two years. You know, I, it won't be forever, you know. Because that's scary to some people. Like, oh, it's oh, great. scary, right? Like I'm <laughs> signing up for, you know, and, and that mentor, you, you know, he has a choice of meeting with you once a month or being on the board of another company once mm -hmm. a month. And that's a really big opportunity cost for him and, and recognize that him or her and recognizing that is, is, is a big piece. And the third is, is give, him actionable, give him actionable steps where he can really feel like he's helping. Hmm. So as opposed to showing up and saying, Jamie, help me, teach me, show me the words of the wise. Well, you know, and, and, and it's- Where should I start? Right, and, 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 it begins, you know, and it begins this whole process where if you come to him and, and you explain to him, hey, I'm having a problem growing my sales department, and I know you've been successful in that. You know, what are the two or three things that could really help me get over the hump? And this is where I'm having problems. Mm. It gives him a very specific thing, and at the end, he feels like he made a big difference. And so giving them the opportunity to win mm. is a really big part of, of mentorship. But, mm. but I, I think in many ways, um, you know, for example, you and I used the same quote earlier before the interview, right? And we were both just taking what we've rightfully stolen from somebody else. <laughs> yes. So, you know, you don't even know if anybody's had an original thought in their entire life. Mm. You know, we're just the amalgamation of the best people that we have encountered. And 
So really grooming those people has been such a shortcut for me mm -hmm. in learning. And, and that would be the, you know, for an entrepreneur, you know, find someone on the next level. If you have a business where you're doing one or two sales and you need to find a guy that's doing one million to five million or find a gal that's doing five million to 20 million. But always, always look up and always offer a hand. Mm, so there's a whole chapter in the book all about finding a mentor. So tell me, give me examples or like how someone can go out and find a mentor, especially if they don't have a lot of relationships beforehand. Sure. Um, so there's an entrepreneurial community wherever you live. And I just moved to Austin. I'm one of Austin's newest residents. And I moved here Woo. from, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't moved, live in Austin, but I want to. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I moved here from, from Boulder, Denver. And so mm. there's a huge, we have a big oh, entrepreneurial yeah. community there. Um, you know, a lot of private equity guys and, and um, you know, tech stars and a bunch of, a bunch of young entrepreneurial groups. And so what I'd do is I'd find an entrepreneurial group and I would, you know, and, 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 and also a great way that I did it was I was looking for money. And so, <laughs> oh, that's good. A lot, Can I have money? No. <laughs> well, a, lot, a, a lot of angel investors, mm. right? And, 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 and so instead of going up and saying, Jamie, would you like to invest in my business, which makes a very defensive situation. Mm -hmm. And if I said, Jamie, I know you've been in the entrepreneurial community for a long time and, and I'm not, uh, and, and what I'd like to do is, is show you my business and maybe you would suggest a couple people that it would be a likely fit for. And it's probably not you, but I'd love just to borrow an hour of your time just to, to, to tell me what you think of, of your idea. And ironically, with a, I did a, a company in the adventure travel business. Oh, really? Yeah, we, we did um, to, software for the operators and then we plugged them in together and then we powered the tabs on Orbit's Expedia and Travelocity, and that sold in 07. Hmm. And you know, the way we found our first venture capitalist was what we call an off-Broadway, which we went up to him and, and we didn't pitch him, but we said, hey, we're gonna go out to the valley. I love a practice session and to get feedback. And it happened to light Ooh, him up. that's good. It is, well, it's, yeah. it's totally no not pressure. intimidating. Yeah. Right? And look, I'm going out to the valley. I'd love to get feedback. It's our first time, it's our first time pitching the A round for this company. And you just approached him cold, like you didn't know him beforehand, though. We, he was at a, he was at an angel conference. Hmm. He was at, uh, it was something. It was a conference called Venture Capital in the Rockies, which uh, which happens every year. And went up and we had a good conversation. And so what do you do? He said, I'm a, I'm a venture capitalist. I said, what do you do? I said, I'm raising venture capital. I'm an entrepreneur. And I said, Hey, I have a trip going up, and I did. I had a meeting out in the valley, but I used it as a kind of a really soft, yeah. almost a soft launch type structure. Yeah, because you don't want to go up to someone and go, Hey, will you mentor me? Yeah. Sound like a good idea? Well, it's like the network marketing business. We're like, hey, you want to join my downline? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't really work that way. Yeah. No. So if you can get that real soft um, approach, and, and frankly, the more people you talk to, um, you know, the, the basic philosophy that I've found for, main, for mentorship mm -hmm. is make strangers your friends and make friends your mentors. Ooh, I like that. But That's if you're authentically who you are, and, you know, and occasionally you might light it up, and occasionally let's say, oh, we don't have any match. And there'll be other people that said, you know, I know a guy that was early in trip.com or was early in send it or mm. who founded Expedia. And all those were true. All those examples were true from that initial off Broadway where all I was doing was practicing my pitch for the deck. I like that. Have you had mentors that have been really uh, good? Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've got a, actually, I have a s specific strategy as Robert did, um, you know, in the internet world when, uh, when I first, you know, became aware of this, uh, this niche and this business model. And, um, uh, and so when I was just a, a young kid in kind of my, my 20s with my, my ebook business, um, you know, selling Magnetic, and I went to uh, Ionic Silver's Underground mm -hmm. conference. I went to the second, the second one, Underground 2. Wow. Yeah, it was the first internet event that I'd ever gone to. And, you know, here I was, the newest kid on the block, and, um, and wanting to find mentors or, or people to help, you know, like Ionic, right? Um, what I would do is... Uh, try to demonstrate value first. Uh, so instead of asking them for something, I would give them something first. Mm -hmm. And I found the best way to do that was to really uh, either endorse or promote their product, uh, you know, as an affiliate or uh, even free or uh, send them a testimonial. And so I remember Yannick was having some kind of conference call at the time for his readers or something. And about 30 minutes before the call, I uh, emailed him a big one-page testimonial of how he had impacted my life and how, what I had learned. And, uh, you know, and he read it right before he got on the call, and so it was fresh on his brain, so he actually read it on the call, and, nice. and uh, I was like, oh, awesome. Uh, but that was kind of intentional. Um, and so I've found that there are really two things 
that work really, really well. One, saying thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this can be a, a thankless gig a lot of times where you're like, uh, you know, you think you've, you've helped a lot of people, but you only hear from one out of 10 who bother to send something, if, if that many. One out of a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny when you see them in person, they'll say it and you're like, well, why didn't you send an email or something? But, I did buy your product before. I didn't send you anything. <laughs> but, uh, so I found Thanks that. You're totally yeah, welcome. I found that saying thank you works really, really, really well and it gets you on the radar and then, and then earning their time uh, by really sending them business. So for me, you know, people always want my time. But if you really want my time and you want me to actually notice it, is, you know, if you're going to promote a product or do whatever, it's like, oh, you know, this kid is taking action and, mm -hmm. and is doing something, um, you know, rather than the, oh my God, help me, I'm drowning yeah. scenario where it's, it's just not a rewarding frame to approach someone with. All of that applies to so. finding mentors too. Uh, right. In, in terms of the help me, I'm drowning. Because mm -hmm. a lot of, when they come to you with that energy, it becomes really repelling. Yeah. It's, you know, it's <laughs> I like, get those too. I'm like, I'm you're sorry. You're get drowned in there. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's interesting to build on what Mike said. Um, you know, I, I think the basic, way your mind frames it when you meet somebody. I, I think beginning entrepreneurs think, well, what can you do for me? Mm. And, and, and my perspective is, what, what can I do for you? Mm. You know, how can we help serve your membership or your readership? And, and by the way, if you help people, it'll come back to you a hundred times. And you know, whether, you, whether you see it or you don't, when you meet someone in a different industry and you say, well, I can do this for you. Say, well, what do you want? You're like, I don't want anything. It's, yeah. it's great. And, and all of a sudden, when you know it, it will come around, and uh, it, it will come around, and all of a sudden, what you have are a bunch of people that want to help you. Mm. And the more people that want to help you, the more successful you're going to be. Seven years of you working your butt off and helping other people, and we just had uh, Bob Berg, who wrote The Go Giver, on the show mm. too, which is yeah. all about he that. He talks you about know? that book all the time. I yeah. do talk about and Bob that. Bob is amazing, and yeah. it's so nice to be able to hear that put in practice too. Like oh, reading yeah. a book is one thing, but hearing it works for you guys too is really kind of amazing. And I know we have to start wrapping up, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I always ask the same last question, and normally I give everyone the heads up, and I totally forgot to give the you the heads up yes. before. 42. Um, so the last question, I'd love for you to separately answer this. It's what's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Like oh, thanks first. for putting me on the spot first. And it's you. Uh, um, uh, so I have, a, I have an email that I wrote years ago, uh, and the, the subject line or the title line was the lamest success secret that you'll ever hear. And so I'd like to share that with you now. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's true. Uh, it's just not very exciting. Um, but back in the day, especially in the beginning, but still to this very day, my entire businesses uh, have been run. Um, you know, it started on Notepad on my laptop, the little, the little WordPad app that every computer has. Now it's Evernote. Um, I'm still using the WordPad. I'm still using WordPad. Is that, yeah, is that for, wrong? No. That, no that's, <laughs> so so from, from, from day one, because you run into that information overload thing and you've only got a, a given amount of time, especially if you've got a job. Um, so the number one real secret that enabled me to, to, to make that, that journey and to, to get to where we are today um, was to just sit down every night, put the three to five tasks down that I had to get mm -hmm. done the next day. And a lot of them were super unglamorous, whether it was you know, redirect the domain name, tweak the AdWord group, write the email to the list, or call so and so. Uh, it was it was waking up and completing as many of those as I could every single day, and then doing that. And that's just I think of each one as a brick, and then doing three to five bricks a day. Two to three years later, you've got a house and a business. And uh, and I wish the secret to success was more sexy than that. But that's really the difference between people who make it over the long term and mm -hmm. people who who try and start over and then try and start over because they're buying into kind of a dream mm -hmm. well the difference is, is the guy who shows up and goes to work every day for three years yeah. and that's just what keeps you on task um that is the, the the big secret behind success is that you just grind through when most people get sick of grinding and they quit I love so. that. And that's the thing that people don't understand before they get into it. So they either get excited and go, why didn't this take off? I must suck. And instead of knowing that like, oh, this is a long term process and yeah. I won't necessarily have this huge $3.4 million in eight days right away kind of a thing, but being able to do the action step by step, yep. even if they're unsexy. <laughs> yes. awesome. The vast majority of them are. <laughs> 
I yeah. love that you said that though, because yeah. we kind of think we're doing something wrong. Like we should be doing some sort of crazy strategy, like, and it is like redirect, redirect their domain name. Woo! Yeah. You know, I did exactly. it. I mean, Sweet. I literally bought the HTML books for dummies and all of that stuff because really? I couldn't afford to hire a programmer. Oh. You know, so. yeah. I, I mean, I, I used to. I couldn't buy them, so I used to. <laughs> there was an old bookstore that was a great bookstore in, in Denver called the Tattered Cover, and I used to walk my dog. They would allow dogs at the time before they served coffee, and I would sit there with my dog and I would read the the HTML Bible in there because I couldn't buy it. I take these notes and I'd go back home and I'd do it and yeah. I'd go back in there. And, That's awesome. You know, it, it's interesting. So the, you know, what would be something that you can do this week and. So I, I talk a lot in my consulting, uh, which will sound really esoteric, around the concept of bending time, mm. and uh, which is sexy. So the, I, I figured I Good. had, I had yeah, you need. I needed to juxtapose it to my cancer. Uh, but the, the, the way that you bend time is actually really unsexy. And so the way that people bend time is they do what their natural ability is, mm. or what I call their stupid human trick. You know, the one thing you do better than anybody else. And, and you remember when you, it, you know, when I was a child, I grew up in the, the days of, you know, Atari and video games. And you had, but, but now they have, they have 100 buttons on the controller, and they used to have two or one. And so everybody had the common move, and then they had the special move. Yeah. You know, one guy can breathe fire, one guy can do a backflip, one guy could do that. And so, for example, Jamie, you're, you're, you're great at interviewing. It's a very natural skill for you. Thank you. And, but that doesn't make it less valuable for your readership. Mm. I mean, just because this is, this is re really this easy is for fun. you. Yeah. It's fun and easy. <laughs> And that's what you do for a living, and you set it up to be fun and easy. Mm. But it doesn't make it less valuable for them. And so for a lot of people, they think it has to be hard to be worthwhile, mm. or it has to be difficult to be worthwhile. In fact, my father is 88 years old, and uh, you know, child of the Depression, World War II. Um, and so he, I was raised with the story, it has to be difficult to be worthwhile. Yeah. And so the one thing that I would say to do this week is really to identify your stupid human trick. And I'll give you some tools to be able to do it. And that's really the one thing that you could do better than anyone else. And it's going to be really natural and it's going to be really easy. And the thing that makes it difficult for people to see is because it's natural and easy for them, they assume that everybody can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Not everybody can, can interview naturally or not everybody can, can write naturally. And so the best way I know to, to figure that out is to go out and find five people that you love friends and family, mm -hmm. and ask them to write a paragraph about what you're great at. And then go ask five of your coworkers, if you're still in corporate America, if you're, you know, and it could be a peer, if you're just starting your own business, whatever the case may be, and ask five coworkers to do the same thing. And what you usually find, if you don't know what your stupid human trick is, is there's gonna be a delta between the five people that, you, that love you, mm -hmm. what they say you're great at. Oh, you're great at bringing the best out of people. You're great at interview, you're great at this and that. And then the five people that you work with, you know, often they're not going to recognize that. Mm. And so what I would try and do is I would try and close that gap. So that really simple exercise is really about self-identification for what you are amazing at. And, and when you understand that, I would get everything else off your plate and I would set it up. So all you do is your backflip all day. So for example, when- I wish when, you guys could do a backflip. No, go ahead. I, uh, <laughs> this would be a great I, idea. Well, <laughs> Mike, are you ready for your demonstration? And, and so, uh, you brought the trampoline out for a reason. Yeah, exactly. And so it's really just about doing mm -hmm. your backflip. So my advice, for example, if you in your business, I don't, I don't know how many people are in your business, but I would have you out doing as many interviews as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And every time you go to, 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 to reply to an email, you know, I would think, you know, oh, don't do that. You know, because there's so many traps. Yeah. And if you really want to bend time, do the one thing that pro provides the most value for, for your customers. Mm. And if you can focus on the one thing that provides the most value, everything else takes care of itself. Mm. And if you're doing something and it feels hard and it feels difficult, stop and really get focused on, on what it is that you do best, but build your business around your stupid human trick and that'll provide scale and lift. I love that you call it a stupid human trick. I think that's great. It's true. It makes it seem so much easier. Okay, so sure. thank you so much, guys. I really, really appreciate it. Where can we find more information on you online? Uh, I'd say just go to the elevationgroup.com uh, or .net, and uh, that would probably be the best spot. Yep, you can find everything out from there. Beautiful. Yeah, and thanks for having you're us. You're on Facebook. You're at, we'll link up to everything so everyone can check you out because you guys cool. are awesome. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for having me over. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Jim. Thanks for coming, Jim. Take, Take care. care.
I had a blast going out to Austin, Texas and doing that in-person interview. I hope you liked it too. It was amazing having a three camera shoot and have it all edited and beautiful in HD. So I hope you guys like that too. I should probably do that more often. What do you think? So if you enjoyed that interview, go to eventualmillionaire.com. Definitely post and let me know in the comment section of this interview what you liked the best. I mean, I think Mike and Robert were amazing and gave some amazing advice. What are you actually going to use this week? Actually going to use. If you go ahead and post it, comment, make sure you do it. You can even put it on the Facebook page and I'll just follow up with you a little bit later. So good luck. Let me know how it goes. I hope you get a ton out of it and I hope you have an amazing week. Take care.